Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning and welcome to the, uh, the 13th annual Night Media Forum. This is our, as you can plainly tell, this is our largest convening ever. Thank you for the hardship of coming back to Miami in February. For those of you like Diane Kaplan from Alaska, I know this is really rough duty for you. I'm Alberto Ibarguen. I have the privilege of leading the, Knight, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which is dedicated to strengthening democracy by supporting informed and engaged communities. The foundation is the legacy of Jack and Jim Knight, brothers who through the la throughout the last century built one of the country's largest and most successful newspaper companies, a collection of proud, independent-minded local newspapers. The economic model, as you all well know, that enabled the Knight Brothers to successfully publish dozens of geographically distinct newspapers, each bound to the culture and context of its place, was already declining in the 90s, 1990s. Advertisers had begun to find more efficient, technology-enabled ways to reach audiences, and readers were migrating to a wider range of other news and entertainment options, and I would observe editorially often not distinguishing between the two. But the tsunami of change had hardly even begun. When I offered the first invitation to the conference, uh, to this conference, to what became this conference, which was actually at the at the Council on Foundation of the um, the Council on Foundations um, Community Foundations meeting, and Robin Ryder, who organized this conference uh, for us the thirteenth time, thank you, Robin. Um, she was sitting just like she is now in the front row, and I just thought this is something we ought to get together for. And I said, well, I don't understand why there's a thousand community foundations and not a single one of you understand that information is at the core of everything that you're doing. So something's wrong and we got to talk about it. And so why don't you all come on us to Miami next February? And this was September and Robin, who is white already, turned whiter still. <laughs> And, and, um, and we did, and that began what has been um, really a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, for all of us. But at that time, we didn't even know the word smartphone. The iPhone had not yet been announced. It was announced some months later. Uh, today, 81% of Americans own at least one. Nearly 40% of Americans now consume news exclusively online, and 13 years ago, it was 4%. And if you can imagine it, 98% of the people who attended that first conference, that first then called uh, Night um, uh, Media Learning Seminar, 98% said that they primarily got their news from a newspaper. Digital has upended the business in obvious ways and in ways we're just beginning to grasp. More people have access to information, it's true, than ever before, that's the good news. And the bad news, of course, is that fakery on the web threatens to stabilize, the st threatens the stability of civic and political life. Media has always been a double-edged sword. This is not new. It's always been a tool for both open and dictatorial systems, but that tool has never been as effective, as quick, or as far-reaching as today. The inventor of the World Wide Web, with all due respect to Al Gore, intended <laughs> In, Tim Berners-Lee intended it to be free and universal, his words. You'll hear from him tomorrow, but over the years, I've heard him say many times that the biggest threat to, the free and, to that free and universal ideal was the lack of authenticity on the web. If there's no authenticity, there is no trust. And if there's no trust in society, it's easy to turn away from the institutions that do the difficult work of protecting freedom in a pluralistic society and flock instead to leaders who will promise easy solutions. We know that road and it leads away from democracy. As you know, trust in American institutions from church to courts to business has plummeted. Among the few institutions that Americans do trust are libraries, 
and the military, and I think it's because their missions are clear. These are really important lessons for us. Their missions are clear, and their execution is apolitical. At night, we saw that some of those same distinguishing qualities, clear mission delivered in an apolitical fashion, uh, and relatively easy to verify in local news. A recent poll from Gallup supports that finding, that most Americans place more trust in local news and feel a deeper sense of connection <clears throat> to local reporters. As a result, and as a foundation rooted in 26 different local American communities, we decided to double down on our investment in local news, $300 million, where the distance between reporter and news consumer is the shortest. Though we're funding uh, local news mainly in the non-for-profit area, we are genuinely business model agnostic. What we know is that to be independent, any news organization, any local news, whatever news organization, whether for-profit or not-for-profit, must be sustainable, must not be dependent. And to accomplish that, they must be run in a business-like way. Examining uh, different ways to build successful, sustainable news organizations, regardless of the platform, is why we're gathered here. As Arthur Sulzberger said some 20 years ago, it's about the news, not about the paper. But if we think the medium does not affect the message, of course, we're doomed to fail. We have to understand where the audience is, why the audience is there, and how to reach them. This work has simply never been more important. A couple of weeks ago, we released another study, this one commissioned from Ben Dixon and Amandi, that examined why 43% of the American electorate did not vote in 2016. 43%. That is, in case you're counting, 100 million Americans who just said, I'll take a pass on the quintessential act of citizenship. What we found directly links voting uh, to news and information. 38% of non-voters said they, they lack confidence that elections represent the will of the people. That's 38 million Americans who doubt our elections are free and fair. And making the link to news, the less likely a respondent was to read and follow the news, the more likely he or she was to feel alienated and suspicious. It really should worry us that people 18 to 24 years old are even less likely than other voters to follow the news, which leaves them feeling less informed around election time and less likely to care or trust elections. The truth is, they not only feel less informed, they are less informed because the necessary work of journalism isn't being performed at the same level any longer. Since our inaugural conference in 2008, a quarter of the newspapers in the country have vanished. 25% have vanished. And not to make it too personal, the company that produced the wealth that allowed the Knight Brothers to endow Knight Foundation has filed for bankruptcy, brings it right home. In response, uh, shortly before the conference last year, uh, we launched, as you know, a $300 million initiative to support and reimagine local news and to search for sustainable operational models. Our investments largely fall into four areas, direct support of local reporting, indirect support of local reporting through national organizations, support of legal efforts to protect local media, and the research and, and research into the impact of journalism and media on democracy. All of these efforts are meant to promote informed citizenry and in an engaged community. And let me talk just a little bit about our progress in this, in this last year since I, I last reported to you. I feel like I'm reporting to the annual meeting of shareholders here. <laughs> uh, old habits die hard. Uh, for, for almost 15 years, uh, which of course in internet terms is about 17 lifetimes, uh, Knight Foundation has been a direct supporter of many experiments in local media. And the fact that you know the names of Texas Tribune and Voice of San Diego and the New Haven Independent, MinPost, Mississippi Today. That's testament that those upstarts have legs. 
when the IRS uh, ruled last year that the Huntsman family could convert the Salt Lake City Tribune into a nonprofit, a precedent-setting decision that affirmed local journalism as a public good, local journalism as a public good, worthy of tax exemption, we were among the first funders of the new entity. And in Philadelphia, with the late Jerry Lenfest, uh, when the late Jerry Lenfest purchased the Philadelphia Inquirer and put it into a trust for the city's benefit, we supported that as well. Our second bucket, investing in national organizations supporting local news, uh, include the American Journalism Project. You'll hear much more about that at this conference, a venture philanthropy initiative that will invest and actively support some 35 local digital news organizations, ProPublica's initiative to partner with local news organizations on investigative reporting projects, the Solutions Journalism Project, which trains journalists to cover not only the challenges communities face, but also how to solve them. The News Literacy Project, which is training tens of thousands of high schoolers around the country. And Report for America, which just announced they will place 250 reporters in 165 newsrooms this year, this year alone, and raise nearly a million dollars in their ongoing search for other support. I think that's not bad for a year's work. Our, <coughs> but we're not done. And I meant that about Steve Waldman and Liza Gross, not about what we did, although what we did was not bad. Our, our third area of funding is in defense of a free press. When the news business was great, and it was, the, the business, uh, the news organizations in this country paid, paid a kind of liberty tax. Uh, they aggressively defended and even expanded the boundaries of free expression and free press in their coverage and through litigation. When I was at Newsday, I was the guy who retained counsel when we refused to disclose our sources in the Anita Hill story, the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas story. So I can tell you, since we paid almost a million dollars to say no, that that tax was, was, uh, was real. But it was also necessary. Uh, news organizations, especially small local ones, can no longer shoulder that burden alone. We and others must step in. Our response has been the creation of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, which I sincerely believe will continue to protect free expression and free press for generations. And Knight's endowment at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press will allow them to manage a national network of lawyers to defend local journalists. Finally, we've also helped create the Knight Research Network to inform future policy with data and understanding. <clears throat> that network includes some of the nation's most respected academic institutions, public and private, representing a range of perspectives and sections of the country. We're committed to understanding how technology is transforming our democracy and how we can intelligently govern the digital public square. What is the role of media and technology in exacerbating polarization among partisan and ideological lines? What are the consequences of re regulating news and information published on social media platforms? What would, be, what would happen if we broke up these platforms? Can democracy function in news deserts? These are just a handful of the many questions the Knight Research Network will explore, is exploring, in order to provide policymakers and regulators with research to inform public policy op options. Knight's investments in these four areas are, this is really important to me that you understand, this is not a lament for the loss of newspapers, but it is about a loss. It's about a civic loss. Without reliable local news, you can't know who you're voting for or what the issues or challenges or opportunities facing your communities are. It is as central as that to the democracy, to the way we run this republic. I should note here that this work largely done last year has been brilliantly led by my colleagues, Sam Gill, our senior VP and chief program officer, and Jennifer Preston, our vice president for journalism. They're in the audience.
I, I, of course, and as usual, will take credit for everything they did that you liked, and any problems, we'll, we'll let them resolve. I, I should also note that this work, uh, that, uh, that I, 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 really, I really do love the fact that this is merely what Knight is doing. This is so different than when we began um, this conference 13 years ago. There are so many more organizations, many represented in this room, committed to meeting the information needs of communities and lessening the gap between those in the know and those who need to know. I'm beyond proud to see more than 600 of you here ready to learn from each other in breakout groups and hallway meetups. You'll meet community foundation and place-based foundation leaders, journalists, media tech experts, and you'll meet some of the best library leaders in the country who are meeting here in an overlapping conference organized by my colleagues, George Martinez and Lily Weinberg. And actually, as a side note, it should tell you something about the way we approach these things that George is vice president for, for, uh, for IT at Knight Foundation, and Lily is director in the communities program. So it is about technology and it is about community. I'm particularly pleased to welcome back uh, Tony Marks, who's president of the New York Public Library and co-chaired the recent Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy at the Aspen Institute, and our former Knight colleague, <coughs> John Bracken, who's now executive director of the Digital Public Library of America. Aside from the breakout groups uh, that will allow for great discussions, you'll also hear from leaders uh, in their fields, like Brian Hooks of the Charles Koch Foundation, Diane Kaplan from Rasmussen Foundation in Alaska, Feather Houston from Wincote in Philadelphia, uh, Javier Soto, who recently just absolutely deserted us in Miami. Where is he? Shame on you for leaving uh, to go to become president of, the, uh, of the, some foundation in Denver. I don't remember the name of it. Gene um, uh, Cochran, who used to be the, the head of the Duke Endowment and has since become president of, interim president of 73 other organizations uh, since his so-called retirement. And my favorite of all time, Mariam Nolan, who has not missed a single one of these, uh, who is the head of the Community Foundation of Southeastern Michigan. She, Ma Mariam also was a Knight trustee who voted on the, on the grant to the, make this initial, uh, this, 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 uh, this conference actually happen. You'll hear from A.G. Sulzberger, the still relatively new publisher of the New York Times, talking about the future as he sees it. Judy Woodruff participated in the very first of these conferences and returns uh, to interview White House digital ch chief digital officer, uh, Ori uh, Reinet, and the digital director of the Obama 2012 campaign, Teddy Goff. Interestingly, Paul, H Paul Huntsman, who I mentioned, uh, is that at the Salt Lake Tribune, the newly nonprofit Salt Lake Tribune will be here. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome my friend, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who, as I keep telling my friends, is the actual inventor of the World Wide Web. You're, in, you're really in for a treat. From the start, this conference had two goals. One was building stronger communities, and the other was to engage funders as active participants in creating an informed citizenry. We began a discussion with community and place-based foundations to figure out what role they might play. Some ran with the idea and others just hung back. But the importance of information to our democracy hasn't changed since then. What has changed is the many, many more people that now recognize that news and information is a thing, as John Oliver would say, in a community and a democracy, a fundamental thing that needs to be nurtured. And that's why we were so thrilled and inspired by Charlene and Ron Esserman's announcement last night to support investigative reporting in South Florida with a two and a half million dollar endowment at the Miami Foundation. The Esserman, yes. The Esserman Family Fund for Investigative Journalism will allow the Miami Herald to investigate reporting fellows to, to, to offer investigative reporting fellowships uh, to early career reporters. 
In partnership with Knight Foundation, the fund will also provide a $10,000 prize annually, the Esserman Knight Journalism Prize, to a journalist whose reporting has made a major impact on the people of South Florida. I've known the Essermans for a long time. They are civic leaders, they are arts community leaders in Miami. But what I love most about this is that now as a family, because this is not just Charlene and Ron, it is their, their four children and their nine grandchildren who are all actively involved in this because this is about us and about our future generations. They have chosen to create this fund to support uh, journalism. As Charlene said last night, a free press is essential for our democracy and for our community. We love that at a time when the future of local journalism is in peril, as she said, they are willing to step up. And I am hopeful that that will be an example to many, many other people. We need to engage more. We need to engage many more partners who share the Esserman's concerns and our concerns about the threat to democracy from a diminished local press. We need to build a broad and deep coalition of Americans who give a damn about our democracy, but are not used to thinking, maybe, uh, about this as a thing they actually can do something about. So going back to the spirit of that first conference, let's raise that thought at every conversation over these next two days. What can we do uh, to convince our friends and colleagues that this is not a spectator sport, that if you're an American who cares, you belong in this game as a player. Let's make sustainability the through line of the Knight Media Forum. Jack Knight said one time, he was 83 and pretty crusty at that point, said, I just want to be known as a guy, and, and this, is my, my, this is what I aspire to, is, as uh, Mindy and Alex who will, will, will uh, tell you. Uh, maybe I'm already there a little bit. Uh, but Jack Knight, Jack Knight said, I just want to be known, in his, in his wonderful voice, I just want to be known as a guy who is open-minded, fair, and opinionated. <laughs> we are here, all of us, to work toward solutions, to work toward those opinions. So let's get started. Thank you.